Great. Hey, thanks, Dustin, and welcome, everybody. Uh, glad to have you with us. So uh, the title of this panel is Why Don't We Have Better Digital Identity and What Could We Do If We Did? Uh, I'm joined by a great uh, panel. Uh, we've got Ann Walwork, who's Senior Counselor for Strategic Policy and Innovation at the Treasury Department. Uh, Pam Dingle will hopefully be joining us any moment. She is Director of Identity Standards at Microsoft. And Patrick Kinzel is the CEO and co-founder of Notarize, uh, startup that's doing some fascinating work in the digital identity space. Um, to get us kicked off, I, I actually thought it was worth talking a little bit about the point Dustin just made, which is that the IGF conference has been going on for years, but this is the first time that you've all actually had a, a panel on the topic of digital identity. And it reminded me, uh, so today I run the Better Identity Coalition. I'm also part of the cybersecurity and privacy team at Venable here in Washington, D.C., 10 years ago at this time, I was working uh, at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, leading the newly launched program office for uh, NSTIC. The, it was a White House initiative called the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. And, um, you know, much as we're just getting to identity here, um, you know, this year with an IGF, uh, I had a meeting shortly after we launched the program with Vince Cerf, who was talking, uh, among other things, about pointing out how Identity was one of those things that when they were architecting the internet years ago, um, they, they didn't quite get around to doing. And with it, um, you know, it's turned out that's created some problems and challenges. And, you know, I think that's, you know, still the case today. Identity is really important to the internet, uh, but it has been uh, something that has taken us a little bit of time to perhaps recognize its importance. So, you know, diving into things in terms of, you know, framing the discussion, um, you know, I talked going 10 years back. I'm going to go back 28 years now uh, to a very famous cartoon. Uh, if you guys are interested in the Internet, you probably all remember this in some cases when it came out. Uh, but it's now been 28 years uh, as of about two weeks ago uh, when Pete Steiner published his famous cartoon in The New Yorker talking about identity in the Internet. And you know, there's a couple of things I've pointed out about how much time has passed. Uh, one, these dogs are dead now because uh, of dog years, unfortunately. And, you know, their, their kids probably are as well. But the meaning of the cartoon has really changed quite a bit over the years in that, look, when this first came out, I think I was a freshman, maybe sophomore in college. Um, and, you know, it was a great way to sort of capture the novelty of going online and, you know, occasionally some of the 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 funky things you might run into. But these days we're actually seeing dogs on the internet being actively weaponized against us in that it's an anomaly when a major breach or cyber incident happens these days and identity is not providing the attack vector. Um, you know, more recently started in 2016, we started seeing some other countries who aren't so friendly to the US actually looking to weaponize dogs on the internet, how you know easy it could be to be, you know, say anonymous or pseudonymous on social media to interfere in our democracy. And so while the dogs might be long gone, the, the problem with the dogs is actually more acute than ever. And it, you know, identity really gets into a whole bunch of different issues, you know, not just the security aspect, but how do you create an identity layer for the internet that also is good for privacy, <clears throat> that can deliver really good customer experiences, uh, that can help different regulated industries with compliance, that can you know, do things in a way that can maybe lower transactions costs. And while there's all these different facets of identity, the one thing that people keep talking about when we're trying to solve this issue is how do we build identity systems that we can trust? And trust on the internet, as I think this audience knows quite well, has been really hard to get right. But identity, if you can do it right, and that's been pretty hard to do, can enable trust. Identity can be the great enabler, providing the foundation for digital transactions and online experiences that are more secure, uh, that are easier to use, and that can protect privacy better than what we have today. The challenge, as my old colleagues at NIST pointed out a few years ago, is that digital identity presents some real technical challenges, that the process always or often involves trying to proof individuals over an open network. It always involves trying to authenticate them over an open network. And these processes and technologies we use to establish and use digital identity provide a whole load of uh, opportunities for impersonation and other attacks. So our approach today hasn't exactly been particularly sophisticated. So, you know, other than bringing a whole, you know, new meaning, if you, you know, you or your family somehow picked up a uh, pandemic puppy during the events of the last year and a half. Um, and, you know, this whole focus on, on questions here has also proven obviously to be really practical in that sometimes with security questions, 
maybe you change your mind, maybe you forget, and then you get thrown into you know, the pit of despair, also known as the account recovery process. And it's especially been an issue when we're having these knowledge-based questions be used for security when the adversaries that we're trying to block with these sorts of things uh, already know the answer. You know, on the authentication side, this hasn't worked particularly well. Anytime you're, you know, coming up with all of these criteria, look, nobody can manage this for one password, let alone 20 or 30 or, you know, 200 or 300. There's really no such thing as a strong password in 2021 in that even, you know, a 64 character password that meets all of these criteria is still susceptible to phishing, to malware attacks, to password reuse, given how many people reuse passwords across sites. And, you know, notably, when you put these things in place, it makes sure employees and customers hate you. In fact, they do everything they can to get around it, like just reuse the same password they had before and put an exclamation point at the end. You know, the idea that passwords can somehow be secure is, I, I think, you know, that, that ship has sailed. And the cost of bad identity solutions, you know, this is a chart that we actually had from, from three years ago when we released our policy blueprint in the Better Identity Coalition. In fact, tomorrow is the three-year anniversary of that. But it starts to show you some of the numbers uh, that we were seeing back then in terms of nearly 17 million victims of identity fraud, nearly 17 billion stolen, massive increase year over year in data breaches. Um, and again, you know, identity is you know, providing the attack vector for a lot of it. So this idea of dogs on the internet really has been growing into something uh, that has some real numbers and some real problems behind it. Synthetic identity fraud online has also been on the rise. This is a chart from a publication that the Federal Reserve uh, published about a year, year and a half ago, where they've been doing a series of papers looking at it's the fastest growing type of financial crime uh, where you'll see criminals essentially create what you know I would call a digital Frankenstein, leveraging you know perhaps a, a real social security number that the credit system hasn't seen, say from you know my ten year old, pairing it with fake information and then tricking the banks and the credit bureaus into thinking that somebody's you know actually real. And of course, all of this just got worse thanks to an awful pandemic that, uh, you know, in addition to sadly killing a lot of people and making a lot of other people very sick, also made it basically impossible to engage in any person in-person transactions for the last year and a half. Uh, and, you know, the numbers of identity fraud we've seen, the labor departments estimated just from state unemployment benefits, organized crime stole more than $63 billion dollars of uh, federal dollars that were given to the states to help people who are out of work. And they think that number might top 100 billion by the time uh, this whole thing's over. This is one example of the challenges we've seen the last year and the doors it's opened up for criminals, you know, thanks to having weak identity infrastructure in the US. So why has all this been so hard to solve? Well, we're gonna talk about this a lot in our panel and I promise I'm gonna get to everybody in a minute. Um, but, you know, I often talk about this from the perspective of the problem we have that I call the identity gap, um, which is it's not that we don't have nationally recognized authoritative identity systems. We've got the driver's license, passport, social security card, which is really more of an identifier than an identity credential. Uh, maybe think something like global entry for a small group of people, but everything we have is stuck in the paper and plastic world where transactions are moving increasingly online. And so a lot of the challenges we've had uh, you know, ever since those dogs in the internet first appeared, is figuring out ways to, to close this gap between the authoritative systems the government has today and the types of transactions everybody's engaging on, which are increasingly digital. And, you know, if you've ever had a knowledge-based, you know, question like this, say applying for a credit card, well, this was an attempt to get around the identity gap. This was industry responding to a probably more of an unconscious decision by government than a conscious decision to not create digital systems that went beyond the paper and plastic ones. So, you know, industry needed something to enable trusted digital commerce and these, you know, solutions that were, you know, generally called knowledge-based verification, KBV, well, that was the best thing that was out there. Challenge has been like that with like many security tools that we could rely on for a few years, the attackers catch up. And these out of wallet questions aren't as secret as they used to be. And, you know, by the way, this has been a problem for quite some time. These clips are from 2015, six years ago, after the IRS had a major breach, when they were allowing people with some pretty weak knowledge base verification to get access to their tax transcript online, which had a whole bunch of sensitive personal information and data. And, you know, as the article pointed out at the bottom, the hackers already had the keys and that we've had so many breaches that the answers to a lot of these questions are now just known these days to the point that a lot of the banks I work with say, if somebody will answer these knowledge-based quizzes too quickly and too accurately, 
it's a sign that there must be fraud on the other end and that your average human probably gets one wrong and probably has to take some time to look something up like their monthly mortgage payment because they might not know it offhand. So I want to jump into the question today, having set the stage here, you know, why don't we have better digital identity and, and what could we do if we did? And I'm going to stop sharing my slides at this point so we can see our uh, fantastic panel a little bit more clearly. But um, let me actually just you know, start going down the line. Uh, I'm going to ask Anne and then Pam and then Patrick to introduce yourselves and um, you know, provide a little bit of opening thoughts and then we'll dig into some questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, let me I'll say that I'm delighted to be here with everybody today. Hey, and we can't quite hear you. I'm not sure if your microphone's... No? That's a little better if you get closer. Then we can't see you as well, but... Ah, okay. Um, let me just see if I can play with... Well, no, I can't do anything with volume. Um, is, does that work? Decent, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so um, let me first give the standard U.S. government disclaimer views I express here are my personal views only and do not represent the position of the Department of the Treasury or any other part of the U.S. government. Um, as Jeremy said, I'm Senior Counselor for Strategic Policy and Innovation in the U.S. Department of the Treasury's Office of Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes, PFFC, where I focus on innovative technologies in the financial sector, including uh, particularly these days, digital identity solutions. I help identify um, and develop policies and strategies to address potential illicit finance and other uh, risks relating to innovation, but also to um, identify the benefits and develop uh, policies and strategies to leverage uh, responsible innovation to support financial inclusion, efficiency, and equitable economic outcomes. I work closely with other US government departments and agencies, bilateral, foreign um, uh, countries, and also international partners, um, including the Financial Action Task Force which is the um, intergovernmental global standard setting body for any money laundering, counter-terrorist financing and counter-proliferation financing. Uh, TFFC leads the US delegation to the FATF and I had the privilege to serve as co-chair and lead drafter of the FATF um, guidance on digital identity, which encourages a risk-based approach leveraging uh, technical standards and frameworks like the NIST 863 um, three suite that was uh, issued in March of 2020. Thanks, Anne. Pam, over to you. Quick introduction. <laughs> That's an impressive introduction. I don't know how to follow that in those <laughs> shoes, but uh, my name is Pamela Dingle. I work for Microsoft. Um, there probably is a Microsoft standard disclaimer. I just don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> but um, in general, I work in, uh, I am the director of identity standards. So I work within the identity and network access division at Microsoft. Um, we work a lot with the standards bodies. And my background is also as a 25 year veteran of identity management. So I have lots of um, experience and opinions on what the best practices are and should be around identity management. Thanks, and Pat. I can sell founder and CEO of, of Notarize. We're a, we're a smaller organization, so I can say that my views do represent those of the company. I also um, <laughs> thought, Jeremy, your introduction was fantastic, and I have my McLovin driver's license right here. So um, Notarize, though, we're an online notary service. Um, started the company to really solve that pain point for consumers and for industry. Um, I think what's interesting for us as it relates to identity, though, is we've had to solve the practical problems of working with regulators to meet the standards to actually have transactions move forward, um, which is no small challenge in something that is state regulated and also has to meet you know, federal or you know, GSE or whatnot policies. Um, so we have been advocating for legislation across the country, helped to pass 34 state laws, numerous approvals from different federal agencies and whatnot, really to solve the practical problem um, of whatever the standards are, ensuring that they can serve uh, customers meeting SLAs, solving issues of access where people might not have what's required um, for transactions to move forward. 
And at the end of the day, a notarization is really about provenance, right? It's about tying an identity to an actual transaction and to the creation of an object, which I think is a, is a sort of second side of the coin that industry and, and government needs to solve for. Um, and I'm excited to be here today and appreciate the chance to participate. Thanks, Patrick. So let me um, actually follow up on that point to ask you know, sort of a basic question for everybody, which is, what do we mean when we talk about identity? Is it a credential? Is it just data or attributes about ourselves? Is it something in between? Um, you know, how do each of you define it? And you know, how, do, how should that sort of frame our conversation? I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, so for us, uh, identity uh, means something that's you know, legally validated. Uh, so the person exists, but it has to be a standard you know, to a level that meets the you know, requirements of that industry. And I think notarization is interesting because a notarization touches real property, mortgage and finance, the legal industry, powers of attorney, different state requirements around witnesses and whatnot. And so it's right sort of in the center of the, that Gordian knot. And if it's not met, it's not valid and it's pointless. And so for me, identity means it, it not is a practical identification of the consumer. It actually has to be all the way to the point of meeting the standard. Um, and I think for us as a company, what's so critical it's not just that I can prove that someone exists named Jeremy in the world. It's that I can prove that that person, Jeremy, was actually physically present and personally took an action. And I think that is the, the core problem that we as a company are trying to solve. And I understand there's many other definitions, but that's the one that I am dedicated to solving. Thanks. Pam or Ann? Uh, yeah. So, um, when um, when I think of identity in the con it's primarily in the context of customer identification and verification regulatory uh, requirements in the financial sector, uh, for example, to open a bank account or access certain other financial services or to obtain government benefits um, or other government payments. And um, in that context, um, we're talking about official identity, which is distinct from um, broader concepts of personal identity that may be relevant for unofficial purposes like buying unregulated commercial goods or services on the internet or social interactions um, on, on media. And so I, I like the uh, bad ups um, guidance's definition of official identity, which is that it's the specification of a unique natural person that is based on characteristics, which in the identity space we, we call attributes or identifiers, of the person that establish the person's uniqueness in the population or the, the relevant context. And, and this is the kicker, is recognized by the government for regulatory and other official purposes. Um, proof of official identity can be either physical or digital or a combination of both. But it, um, at least at this point um, in time, depends on some form of government provided or issued registration, documentation, certification, um, such as the uh, kinds of things that uh, Jeremy was pointing to for a certificate identity card um, um, that, that um, provides evidence of the core identity uh, attributes. Um, so um, I, I also, um, I guess I would also say that when we talk about identity solutions, we um, are talking about kind of, we have a comprehensive view that includes all of the um, components uh, addressed by the technical standards of the NIST, uh, identity proofing and enrollment, authentication, um, and credential life management, and when it's relevant, um, federation um, or other um, architecture that um, enables portability of, of digital identity. Thanks, Anne. And Pam? Uh, I I think I would take a more metaphorical view of this. Um, you know, um, everyone, so the only sure thing about identity is that everyone has a different view of what identity means. It's literally the only absolute, but um, the way I think of identity is a clothesline. And um, when you think of the different ways that you interact with the people in your life, the relationships you have in your life, those things are, are 
you know, clotheslines on which you can hang events, you can hang uh, meaningful conversations and credentials and various other things. So, um, so as an example of this, when you look at um, identity and access management from an I corporate IT perspective, right? It is very, um, it's, it's really cool that uh, Patrick, you and I are on this call because we have very different views of this, but in, in an IT perspective, you know, the clothesline is really the organization's relationship with, with a given person. And so, you know, when, when you talk about identity proofing, that often is the start of the clothesline, right? So you put your identity proofing events, you hang them on the clothesline, the clothesline keeps moving. And then you start to assign credentials, right, to that relationship. And you start to assign um, access and entitlements to that relationship, right? And, and the whole time, time is moving on. And so you're accumulating you're accumulating good, good things like entitlements, you're accumulating data, right? Organizations are collecting data about you and accumulating that. Um, events are happening like job changes, uh, you know, and, and you can think of that entire clothesline as the timeline of, uh, of an interaction that represents your relationship with somebody. And so, you know, thinking of identity as that, as this set of clotheslines that emanate from you as a human, right? And interact with other parties is the best metaphor I've found to talk about, about identity concepts. I like that. And I have not used that one before. Let me, you know, digging into some of the elements, you know, NIST, you know, sort of, you know, breaks it down into three things when, with identity. It's one, identity proofing, which is, hey, I'm trying to open an account for the first time or prove that I'm really Jeremy Grant and a particular Jeremy Grant. What are the processes you need to do there? The second is after that, authentication, essentially the password problem. How do you log in? How does Microsoft or Notarize or the Treasury Department know it's me once I've already established an account? And then the third is federation, which is, hey, I've already gone through this process to get a trusted credential one place. How can another party decide to, to trust it? Any thoughts from any of you on what parts are easier to solve these days or you know, where the biggest challenges are? Well, I'll jump in um, and um, flag remote identity proofing um, as a challenge because, as you pointed out, um, the most of the underlying infrastructure in this country, such as uh, digitalized um, state driver's licenses or U.S. state and local databases that or registries at this point. Um, that either private sector identity providers or government um, uh, relying parties could ping against um, to verify identity attributes haven't been developed yet. And um, I'd also flag that too many people have difficulty obtaining or producing, um, if they once had them, they may have lost them, um, the government issued identity evidence that is required to establish uh, official identity um, under um, either industry practices, financial sector understandings of what's appropriate or, and, and regulatory requirements um, or under um, the overarching Real ID Act standards for identity proofing. Thanks. Pam or Pat, any perspectives? I, I would say they're all hard. <laughs> None <laughs> of them are easy by any value of easy, um, but they're very different. Um, you know, the, the, the blessing of uh, federation, for example, is that it is essentially stateless for the most part, right? You can, you know, if you think of federation as a secure introduction across domains on the internet, Right, you're you're kind of pinning a letter to the chest of of the small child and sending them across the park, right, um, to introduce them to somebody, if you will. Um, that that statelessness is is valuable uh, because it reduces cost. Um, but what you know what's happening right now is that authentication used to be stateless. Uh, so when you think of of where we came from, we came from a world where everyone had a a string that was a password. And essentially all you had to do to enable your application to use passwords was to 
check the string and then forget the person ever asked, right? You would just test a password to see if it matches and then forget. And what's happened in authentication is that that has been obliterated, right? It's been blown into 50 million pieces because attackers are um, using that forgetfulness, that statelessness in authentication to attack. And so, uh, you know, with authentication, the challenge is now that we need that state. We need state in sessions. Um, we need state, you know, we need to be able to remember who's, who's failing authentications just as much as who's succeeding at them, right? And that statefulness is bleeding over. It's, it is in fact bleeding into federation as well because what we're finding is that forget, forgetfulness across domains is as dangerous as forgetfulness within them. Um, so, you know, for me, those are the exciting ones and those are the ones I know best. And so I would probably call them the hardest. If I was going to chime in, I would say that um, I think we as a company, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're not the government, we're not a massive, you know, multinational corporation with all these use cases. So for us, we have the advantage of focusing on use cases, right? Um, you know, the mortgage closing experience, an online auto sale. Um, and that allows us to really try to understand exactly what's, you know, standard we need to meet. So, so for us, we don't see proofing as a, as a challenge. You know, we're, we're confident we meet the requirements that we need to meet, you know, Solving that on a global basis, I think, is an exceptional challenge. And I think it really is something that government needs to step in. And I know we're going to talk about that later um, and provide, you know, better, better services. I think for us, I really agree with, you know, your expression, Pamela, around this, the statelessness or statefulness for authentication. I think, I think one of the things as industries are moving digital, I think the real goal is how do you have all of the benefits of secure identity and all of the benefits of frictionless online commerce, right? And those can be at odds. And so, you know, for example, we may be able to meet the requirements for our industries, but those requirements may require a unique proofing event in coordination with whatever we're trying to do. And that's not a palatable experience for a lot of consumers. There is an expectation I will do this once. And when I come back, I won't have to do it again, which really gets into this con concept of of you know the statefulness of of the proofing that you've you've accomplished. I think the other thing is that a lot of folks think of this as a gate versus a, a long running service or benefit, and you can't do those things until you actually have statefulness. You have a lasting identity, you know, with the consumer. And I think um, a lot of progress being made. They all are very hard, uh, but you know, I think the thing just to add quickly is that notaries in the legal context are considered proving agents. Um, and I think that's one of the interesting things I didn't appreciate when I started the company. And it's why it's given us a lot of opportunities to move in this space is that, you know, a lot of um, experiences, it would not be natural to introduce a human into the process. But when, when the very experience itself requires a human interaction, the classic something you have, something you are, something you know, I think that, you know, giving people a digital credential, possession of the credential is not sufficient, right? You still have to know that the person actually has the right to possess the credential, right? Um, and the online you know, notary interaction, I think is really, it's been an interesting place for us to try to move out from. I think that's an interesting point, Pat, in that you know, my, my next question was, you know, why is the US struggle to develop and implement digital identity infrastructure? You make a point that the notary has been part of physical identity infrastructure for years. It's a you know, special category of professional recognized under law that's allowed to attest that somebody really is who they claim to be. Um, and yet, you know, you've got a startup company that, you know, I'd say you and maybe a couple of peers have almost dragged, you know, an entire set of, of government and industry players. I don't know if kicking and screaming is the right word, but it's taken, you know, firms like yours to say, we ought to be able to do this online as well. And I know in many cases, you've, you've had to you know, engage on a state-by-state -state basis to change laws or regulations. Why is it that you, and I want to throw this to others as well, think is that the US has struggled to develop and implement digital identity infrastructure? Um, so let me, let me throw that back to you. And I realize that might be a tough one for you in government, but. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot in that one. Uh, you know, given our experience, um, I think that's a very, very, very complicated set of issues for people to understand. And I think that especially notary law, um, it's, it was largely settled you know, for a long period of time. So the people that would be the regulators are not actively engaged in the subject matter, right? 
um, and they're not actively engaged in ident- you know, the issues of identity and whatnot. And so you have to you know, create knowledge and, and shared language and vocabulary and just address the issues to have momentum. And I think what you're seeing now going from two states to 34 and soon 38 is there's finally, you know, um, Uniform Law Commission, Council of State Governments, you know, all these organizations that have done the work and created infrastructure for people to have have good dialogue. Um, I think the other thing is that culturally, I think as a, as a country, and I would, you know, say at the, at the federal level, we have to make some philosophical decisions about what we prioritize. And I think about, you know, the notions of KBA and whatnot, it's, it's frankly, in my view, um, and I say this with all due respect, but it, it's a way to have our cake and eat it too as a country where we, we push the responsibility onto private industry to manage credit profiles um, and then talk about the issues with that. But the only authoritative source is government. But then do you move into biometrics? Do you move into what you know, methods of authentication? And we have to make some really big decisions, I think, culturally, what we prioritize in order to move to move these things forward. So I think, you know, our position as a company is we will make do with the infrastructure that's in place today, right? Because I think that there's areas where we can move forward and make progress, but um, it's super, super, super complicated. And it's right at the heart of privacy, the right to anonymity, the right to government tracking, biometrics, like these are cultural, you know, foundational issues in our country. Thanks. Pam, any perspectives on your side? Yeah, I, I think that there's also And we are losing you again. You're frozen. Um, in terms, especially with the digital. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to take a moment afterwards to um, try to just phone in so we can use that. But uh, so when I disappear to go get my uh, phone, please forgive me. But can you hear me at all now? Much better okay. when you're closer. Okay. So um, I, I think that the fact that we haven't really fully um, both in the private sector and in government recognized at, on a kind of consensus level that digital identity infrastructure has become critical financial sector infrastructure for both efficiency, anti-fraud, combating money laundering, terrorist financing, um, and that also makes it national security infrastructure. We have been looking at cybersecurity and funding it increasingly without fully looking at how digital identity, both the um, uh, identity proofing and then linking that identity to trustworthy credentials um, is a part of cybersecurity, but it's addressed very separately, both in terms of um, financial institutions um, that separate AML customer identification um, from anti-fraud measures, even though anti-fraud measures are using the most incredibly sophisticated, in some cases, forms of um, of digital tools from cybersecurity um, and, and data privacy. And I think we need a, both a whole of government and a public private um, initiative to really recognize that if we're talking about losing $100 billion a year to, to fraud um, and granted that we don't really have good statistics on the total amount of identity related um, fraud, either on the government or in the private sector, which itself is an issue that I personally think needs to be addressed. Um, we, we need to look at this as something that's urgent, just as we're looking at the incursions on um, our private, our critical private sector infrastructure and our government systems, but to understand that digital identity is part of that infrastructure and um, to understand we can't solve the issues that we are focusing on without looking at this issue more holistically. And I, I I'm going to qu- stop now because I probably shouldn't comment on existing um, legislation, et cetera. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I will only add that there's a this is a also a people problem and a systems problem. Like these, you know, every single one of these 
things are in some sense bubbles that have existed for a long time that have people in them with habits and with um, who understand where the, where the boundaries are. And what we're doing is we're pushing people beyond those boundaries, right? So when you have whole systems of people who understand how documents work, they, un, you know, they understand their place in the system, right? And then we ask them to change those systems. And it's really easy for people to rebuff that, for, for people to just constantly revert to what they know, right? And so, you know, the beauty of a top-down mandate is that you force people to go beyond their boundaries. But, you know, in the U.S., that isn't, it isn't how we work, right? We work, we work essentially, I think, on almost on a viral adoption program where you, where you have to get enough viral momentum to push past a boundary that would otherwise just repel people back into their comfort zones. So that's, that's where we are now is trying to push those boundaries. In, in terms of what government can do, this would be a loaded question given the role I play in the Better Identity Coalition. Um, but you know, what are there, th what could government be doing more that could help address this challenge that you all see out there? Well, uh, I don't want to always go first, but um, I'll take the I'll take the arrows. Um, you know, when we started the company, um, timing wise, it was 2015, and, and just to give one example, uh, in 2012, the CFPB had conducted a pilot around electronic mortgage recognition that the industry needed to wanted to digitize. Why hadn't they? And uh, there was really two. There's many issues, but two critical issues that jumped out of me and it's the basis for the company. One was lack of access to digital notarization and lack of legal clarity. And the legal clarity challenge, I think people don't appreciate, but it is absolutely you know, holding back progress. Um, and I agree with the point that Pamela made in this country about you know, viral adoption. Things have to get to a critical mass. You have to have industry adopting. You have to prove the effic efficacy. You have to get to the second order problems. Right when systems start to be in scale and at place and functioning, right, um, and so you know, in my mind, there's a lot of places in the country where there is either gray or opposed policy between you know agencies, and I think that when you when you think about changing policy, we need to have an approach of what's the problem that we're trying to solve for, and what what are all the places that this actually touches, you know, in, in government, you know, wherever it may be at the state and federal level and try to make meaningful progress forward, I can give a thousand examples, right? Um, and I think that what ends up happening is you have large industries that are choosing not to move forward because the issues are so complex, right? I think about some of our conversations now around, around NIST, I'll have the conversation with five different people about whether or not a process complies with the law and I will get five different responses, right? Um, and so it's very difficult to go into an enterprise and talk about adoption when they will have the same five conversations and the question is, do you comply or do you not, right? And so for me, it's just the work of, of engagement, of consensus, of getting clarity on these issues. So even, even if, it's, if it's too hard and too ambitious for us to, to solve the, the high order issue of proving identity on the internet, again, we can make progress so industries you know, can move forward. I, I think the other thing I would just add is um, I often run into what I would call frontier tech, right? Um, in, these, in these areas, and, and there are companies who pitch the ability that if you jump upside down five times, I will magically know that you're Jeremy. And oftentimes people in policy positions will, will grab onto that. And it's a theoretical, you know, state, right? The notion that you can, I'm not going to get into and, and cast aspersions, but I think, I think the real challenge is the bridge, right? And access and the industries that we have in this country that have federal regulations that they have to follow about not treating customers, you know, differently, right? And not everyone has the world's greatest iPhone, right? And as a country, it's not just a top-down mandate. It is a, we need a bridge strategy to bring everyone into this, you know, new era and to ensure people have access to the critical services, which are increasingly being, you know, being digitized. And I think that's a really hard conversation to have as well. Other perspectives on the government side? I'm happy to jump in if nobody does. No, I'll, I'll take the bait. <laughs> So um, I think that more, and again, speaking personally, I think that um, more robust um, uh, certification 
um, against technical standards and audit um, so that both the government um, agencies at state, local, and federal level um, can understand what solutions meet their needs given the risks they face um, and, um, and efforts to uh, work maybe through the kinds of public-private partnerships that the FDIC has just proposed for exactly that sort of voluntary certification um, in the digital identity space would be, um, as well as in other innovation um, as it impacts um, various sectors would be really helpful. Um, I know that Jeremy has been doing um, identity work, not only with the financial sector, but also, sorry, also with healthcare. And I think both um, in terms of what the government can do there, um, looking at um, where there are similar needs um, for technology solutions and, um, and then trying to use uh, governments, uh, economies of scale as customers. And in that regard, um, I'd say we, we haven't been sleeping asleep at the wheel. Um, the GSA has um, an across government, cross agency digital identity uh, strategy to um, develop the kind of in institutional structures for promoting a modular um, risk-based um, digital identity procurement use and feedback type of system that does um, have um, in creating the, the structures for that. It's not only US government has advisory, um, um, it will have advisory um, structures that, that in, um, pull in the private sector as well. I think going ahead and implementing that at whatever level is necessary to actually get it done um, and to actually implement um, the updated ICAM strategy, which in fact calls for just that sort of um, leveraging of, of private sector or, or government um, solutions, um, but coordinating um, in a way that, that is privacy preserving, consent-based, um, cyber secure, and, and having an ability, for instance, through um, GovRAMP to have those products certified. Um, so, so I think that's one thing that both is happening, but that may need higher level um, impetus. I will just add one quick thing, which, um, you know, what I've, having been in this, in this game for quite a while now, I've seen uh, successful public-private collaborations and, and failed ones. Um, but the one thing that I think has worked incredibly well, if I was going to choose a poster child here, is the NIST 800-63 uh, work that's been done, where, and, uh, where specifically that work is living. Like it's, you know, it, it's not a case where you've created, you know, 10 draconian rules and you're now going to stick to those rules for the next 20 years. Uh, you know, that, that specification um, is really, it, it personifies the um, industry best practices that are at the forefront and they are, you know, and it is just such a leadership position to forget for the US government specifically to have taken. So my recommendation would be to look at how you can do more things in that 800-63 vein. And for those of you who don't know what 800-63 is, it's specifically around how authentication methods can be combined to give you uh, greater and greater levels of assurance. So, and I'll say on, on the digital side, I was you know hinting this was a leading question. You know, we're now two weeks from legislation being introduced, the bipartisan bill in the House called the Improving Digital Identity Act. Um, in fact, there will be a hearing in the House Financial Services Committee this Friday at noon that I'll be testifying at about that bill and this broader topic if you wanna have another couple hours of virtual discussion. But it approaches it from the way, you know, similar to how the Better Identity Coalition's talked about it, which is 
we have authoritative identity sources, but they're stuck in the paper and plastic world. How can we come up with a model where anybody could ask an agency who issued them something on, in paper and plastic to also vouch for them online? And you know that is a model around the idea of government attribute validation services. Um, that at least sitting here in Washington D.C. is you know yeah, we think we're getting more buy-in into that concept as a way to try and bridge some of this gap between physical and digital. You know that then you know to the point Pam made or you know to the point Patrick's made or Anne provides you know stronger evidence directly from the truth bureau the authoritative source that issued it which can then you know potentially take some of the the doubt out um you know involved with you know some of the other tools that are out there um although the, the role of government here of course then you know starts to raise questions around well what role is too much um and I actually want to jump ahead a little bit to my question list and actually reach into some of the Q&A that, that's open right now in the Zoom, because uh, we've got a couple of questions around privacy. Uh, you know, one person says, is there some way you can stratify my identity information to make sure the supermarket may not get to know my mobile phone number just because I'm presenting a credential? Uh, Mike Nelson, you know, talked about, you know, I'd like to have a privacy enhancing identity service so I could verify maybe two or three of my attributes, but not all of them. What's sort of the art of the possible with that these days? And, and where, you know, is that going? I can I can jump in if, if that works for everyone. So yeah, in fact, I was going to point to you first. I think the standards <laughs> work you're doing here is really relevant, Pam. Yeah, there's some really interesting work happening right now. And it's, you know, in some ways it's really innovative. And in some ways it's very much building on, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants when it comes to this. Um, you know, the, 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 this, the best, uh, most awesome option here, if you will, um, at this point, you know, is what we would call selective disclosure, right? So when you talk about, you know, um, ideally what you could do is have a credential, for example, from your uh, driver's bureau that contains your, you know, for example, your age of consent, and you should be able to prove to the supermarket that you are over the age of consent to buy a cigarette without um, disclosing all of the other pieces of information in your driver's license. That's, I would say, the sort of the, the holy grail, if you will. Um, the, the digital equivalent of that, right, the way we generally do that is with cryptography. And the goal is to be able to cryptographically um, limit what gets disclosed. Now, there's, there's obviously user experience challenges to that explaining, you know, having, having folks understand what they're disclosing and what they're not. And then there are, um, you know, there is a concept of what's called a zero knowledge proof, right? And that is the cryptographic vehicle that we want to use to do this selective disclosure. Now, there are other ways to do selective disclosure, right? You can, for example, go back and get a new credential, right? Get a, a credential that contains only the information necessary for this real-time transaction. Right? That's a perfectly valid way to do this too. And um, you know, that is a more historical way, way to have this happen. A lot of attribute exchange services work in this way as well. Um, but the, the promise of a zero knowledge proof is this idea that it can be ad hoc, right? That the supermarket does not have to have a relationship with your identity authority in order to be able to consume that super simple proof. And so, so that, you know, that would be my, you know, the, the shining light um, that is on the horizon right now would be zero knowledge groups. Other perspectives on the privacy front. I, I would add, um, I agree with all that. Interestingly, just full circle, that I, I worked at Microsoft for a number of years. I, yeah. um, it was a while ago, but in 2008, pre-Microsoft, I, I was an author of something that was called the Internet Users Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And it was about um, exactly these issues. And then when I was at Microsoft, I worked with Facebook on what they called granular data provisions. And there was the idea that exactly like this in their centralized repository, people could only you know, access. I, I believe that's absolutely where the internet needs to get to. And if it doesn't get, get there at some point, I, I have a feeling that Pam's gonna be very, very disappointed. I will, I will as well. It's absolutely the right you know, future state. I, I think, again, the challenge is how do we get there? You know, and and who, are the, who are the organizations that have to adopt it to make that a real? And I think that's where, I, I don't know, as, anywhere near as much as Pam, but I think if there's not real engagement from large financial institutions in the government, it's not going to happen. And then also if that's not flows through into, you know, um, KYC and AML policies and all this other stuff, it's, it's not, 
there's no there's no purpose to it. I would say more broadly with consumer privacy, I really, really, really hope that as a country we make progress on that issue because I think it's important first and foremost. And second of all, I think it's a hindrance to a lot of other re regulatory innovation. I would say for us at the state level, the number one issue with advancing our, ours is that it becomes mired in a larger consumer privacy discussion and debate but it's the same as a healthcare bill. It's the same as a, a digital identity bill. It's the same conversation being inserted into, into what are use case or industry specific issues, right? And so, you know, in California, we comply with the CCPA, whatever. You can comply with the regulations once you know what they are. So I'm hoping that there's a there's broader progress on consumer privacy so that issues can be debated, you know, in isolation. Um, and I, um, I'm optimistic. There's obviously, you know, a lot of debate and discussion that's happening, but they, um, it touches everything. And, you know, let me shift a bit in that, you know, while there's plenty of other countries struggling with these issues, there are some that have really, you know, blazed ahead. Um, you know, I, it, it's, you know, when you look at what, whether, you know, very different approaches between India, Estonia, uh, Europe, Singapore, what do each of you think that we can learn from other countries here in the U S and also what, what wouldn't we want to replicate? What might a distinctly American approach look like when it comes to, you know, doing something with digital identity that's different than we have today? Uh, yeah, no. Oh, I, I was just going to say that um, I think, unless I'm mistaken and maybe things will change or have changed and, and the pulse needs to be read again, but we do not have an, a central national I, digital or other identity system um, that's, that's comprehensive um, in this country. And I don't think that we want one, um, but that, um, that said, it gives us an advantage of having a very open marketplace um, in digital identity solutions where you may have government um, departments and agencies uh, providing identity solutions, but also a really robust role for the private sector. Um, and I, I think that's a very good thing um, in terms of security, cybersecurity, not having a central honeypot, um, protecting us against um, abuse, um, and the potential for abuse um, for inappropriate um, access that, that, that could occur in some countries um, with national ID systems that, that could use them for surveillance or other, um, or bias against um, vulnerable groups. Um, and I, I also think that um, our system will be technology neutral, that, um, that zero knowledge proofs are really exciting and we need to work really um, aggressively together to resolve the, I, I think to me personally, the, the tension between transparency and the um, illicit finance um, protections versus privacy and what we're seeing in terms of data localization in some countries, et cetera, um, that can be resolved. I don't, I don't think it's pie in the sky can be resolved by, by innovative, um, technology. And I think we need to get there as soon as possible, um, and have the, uh, privacy authorities and, and, and frankly, advocates, whether they're in the private sector or, um, or government authorities and the financial sector integrity um, and efficiency um, officials and, and interest groups really work together on that. And, and I would like to just note that the Financial Action Task Force um, is doing exactly that by reaching out to um, privacy, governmental privacy authorities and advocacy groups and bringing them into the digital identity work stream at the FATF, um, where the fundamental mission is financial sector integrity. Other perspectives on things from across the globe. Pam, I know you're engaged quite a bit globally in the standard space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some great examples. There are there are good features and bad features of of what lots of these places have have gone through. I mean, I think the 
um, United States does not have the luxury of considering a monolithic approach. Like I don't think it's even possible. Um, and I'm, I'm actually happy with that. I think that the best option here is to define domains of control that are you know, legally and technologically um, separable, but that have known standardized relationships between them. So you know, an example of this would be on the biometrics front, I saw some comments there on the biometrics, right? Um, there are reasons sometimes to do centralized bi biometrics and they're valid reasons, you know, for, especially in government for deduplication um, purposes, for example, for benefits. Um, but, um, you know, the, the one thing I would suggest we, we not do is, uh, you know, I suggest we constrain that use to, the, to, to where it's appropriate and look at um, where biometrics can be used in other use cases in a much different format. So, for example, in authentication, you know, the best practice in authentication is that your biometrics should not leave your device, right? Those biometrics should be locally stored. And they, you know, um, that is a pattern that is important. And no one pattern is correct. We just have to get the right patterns applied to the right part of our segmented world. Thanks. And I'll add on, you know, the Estonian side, I mean, I feel like th this comes up time and time again, and that the Estonians really have created. If, if there is a platonic ideal of what you could do with a national ID card, you know, that's sitting in the cave somewhere, it's certainly what the Estonians have done. It's really impressive. But I, I think, as you know, all of you have pointed out, that's not a model that's going to work in the U.S. And I, you know, often you know have noted um, Estonia is impressive. It's also a country with a population that's smaller than Fairfax County, Virginia, just here outside the district, um, and actually a heck of a lot less diverse. Um, and the other thing that I think it's lost sometimes is a lot of what's motivated the very impressive investment in digital ID and digital government from Estonia is that they they weren't a country for years after they were absorbed by the Soviets, and so much of what they've invested in is also driven by um, this fear of this existential threat that still remains immediately to their east in Russia and that one day they might invade again and they want the ability to basically run a government in exile, which you could only do digitally. Um, so that's a fascinating set of, of motivators that are all really different than you know, what we deal with here in the US. And you know, I think as you start to pick those apart, it makes clear you know, some other types of solutions might be needed. I wanted to pivot a little bit to the issue of inclusion and identity, um, which I think is, is rightfully getting much more attention in that um, turns out it's not so hard to get an ID in the US in many cases these days. So, and you know, we'd love to get perspectives from each of you in terms of where are there challenges? Where do some of our systems fall short? And, and what's the impact on those who, who might be excluded? I, I think a lot about this. Um, and I think that um, there's a lot of issues. I think that um, to talk about mortgage, for example, mortgage documents are, are generated in English, right? Not everyone speaks English. Um, you have to, under the, the standards that we follow, have to take a picture of the front and back of a credential that has to pass, to pass a software-based forensic analysis. Not everyone has a camera sufficient to do those things. Um, people who speak foreign languages are subject of notarios publico fraud, right? Which is that people, you know, gallivanting as immigration attorneys and they're not. Um, and so we force people through processes that they may not have the um, capacity. You know, if you think about a, a video session, you know, physical impairments, the equipment, you know, I can go on and on and on, right? Um, and yet, you know, the future that we're all creating here, you know, people are, are getting better service. They might be getting discounted pricing. Right. Um, and those issues. And that is not that's not cool. Um, and so these are very, very real issues that we have to solve for. Um, and I think, you know, that's why your comment Anne, about, you know, risk based approach, alternative means of the validation. You know, that's the world that we live in. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I don't know what the solution is there, but we're we're very diligently working on these issues. Well, I, th I think you point to a, a couple of, of factors. One is that it's important that digital trans 
this should not result in further exclusion um, from either civil society or from um, financial health healthcare, um, education. And we've seen that uh, during the pandemic. So I think that we need to have, um, and I think the um, administration certainly does have and is trying to implement an expansive view of what critical infrastructure is um, for a digital world. Um, that includes access devices, um, and and programs to expand um, the internet um, broadband, um, but they they need to be really looked at very hard and funded appropriately. I think another challenge is you know we talk about the digitalization of the financial sector and a move to e-government, um, but in this country our foundational um, government-issued um, identity starts with a birth certificate, and that is either, you know, is, I believe, local um, registry um, and other, other um, sources of information are state level. Even, even the, um, the driver's licenses, the information that they get, it's at this point, as Jeremy notes, is, is documentary. Um, you do have to come in in person. Um, I, I think that may continue to be appropriate um, in terms of the, the higher levels of security that we need for under the Real ID Act and for certain kinds of um, regulated financial activities or accessing healthcare information, et cetera. But um, we don't pay much attention to the need to digitalize and support the digitalization um, in a trustworthy way of those basic databases for um, verifying identity. Um, and um, we really haven't to date funded um, the transition in the states um, to mobile driver's licenses, which I, I really do believe um, can be a game changer. Um, and we are seeing incremental um, moves both by some states moving ahead to do that transition and also by um, under the Dodd-Frank amendments, the requirement that the Social Security Administration open up um, an app for pinging against to uh, in a privacy preserving yes no way um, to verify that a per a person um, with a given name address and social security or no I guess it's name date of birth and social security um, number exists but there's there's no credentialing that uh, digitally that ties that data to a given individual that that individual or private sector identity solutions, et cetera, can leverage. So I think we need to really um, value our um, federal system, um, it, but we need to look at how um, we need to help the components of it, state, local, as well as federal um, departments and agencies move forward in a way with digitalization that is secure um, and privacy preserving and safe um, as again, a matter of national security infrastructure. So. Other perspectives on the inclusion side. So there's so many angles to this. So, so many angles, right? I mean, there's the you know questions about our aging population and how we can help our aging population. There's questions about you know um, access to technology at all, even having access to technology like Anne talked about. Um, I, th I think to look on the bright side of this and to look at the opportunities that we have um, while still respecting that we can't leave people behind, I think is, is um, you know, we do have some really interesting opportunities for example, you know, I mean, the idea of user experience reform in a forms-based world is a pretty tough thing to talk about, right? But if we can find a digital paradigm that's gonna work for folks, we really do have the opportunity to iterate, right? To, to 
really study the user experience to be able to, to create trends, you know, of who is falling off. Like, you, you know, it's very difficult to know who doesn't finish a form, I think. I mean, not that I'm an expert here, but, you know, um, it's much easier to know what the drop-off rates are, for example, digitally. So, you know, I, so I do hope that um, whatever we create, we then can apply all this science of user experience, digital user experience, to try to help those um, those folks to have a greater experience online. Yeah, and, and I would also kind of add that programs, whether they're private sector or government, to um, identify identity gaps um, that are particularly pertinent to um, disadvantaged or vulnerable groups and then help them um, get the um, access to the identity evidence that they currently need um, is very important for inclusion. But um, so is a risk-based approach. Um, and I'd like to kind of, um, kind of promote uh, a reading of the FATF's digital identity guidelines, guidance rather, um, because I think it really lays it out for the lay reader how um, you can look at using digital identity solutions in the financial sector, for example, um, and, and calibrate the level of, say, identity proofing or authentication, both to the risk, but also to the way to other ways of mitigating those risks. So, for instance, um, the FATF um, recognizes that in low-risk situations, you may have simplified customer due diligence, and low-risk situations can be created not just based on a customer profile, but also on limiting um, the functionality of a given financial products. Um, so, if they have transaction um, uh, number limits per, you know, in a given period or vol uh, volume limits or value limits, um, you, um, you may be able to have um, more flexible um, ways of identifying um, and using the attributes. And I think that that guide, that the guidance also points out that, you know, there are different ways that governments in establishing what the processes and attributes for official identity are can approach that. And if um, that one is a very rules oriented, you must have this, 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 and you must, uh, in terms of attributes, you must have that, 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 in terms of evidence. Um, that's challenging um, in a digital framework that, um, in terms of leveraging um, evolving technologies. And if you have regulatory frameworks that are risk-based and that are um, outcomes or principles-based, um, for instance, the BSA says that a financial institution should have a reasonable belief that it knows who each of its customers is. That is an example of um, of an um, of a kind of outcomes um, and principle-based. Um, approach. Um, so, you know, I think I think that understanding and then leveraging the flexibility that could be there to promote financial inclusion um, is really important. It's, it's an issue that we see a lot in our engagement with the development community that still um, tends to see um, uh, transparency and integrity controls, AML um, requirements in opposition to financial inclusion, whereas um, we certainly see them as mutually reinforcing. Um, we, we are very interested in the reason I you know, have financial um, innovation as part of my portfolio and look at it from an inclusion perspective is because the more people we can bring in to the regulated financial sector, the more uh, those financial transactions are subject to not only AML, CFT um, 
protections, but also consumer protections um, and, and privacy protections. Um, so I think that, that I would encourage everyone to think hard about um, what flexibility and ways of, of looking at um, different technologies in, in, in the regulatory contexts is. And, and in that regard, I think it would be really very helpful if both the private sector and NIST could work on dynamic authentication um, standards in the context of identity. Um, you know, we see that at a very robust level being used for anti-fraud measures where it's the financial institution's ox that gets scored. Um, that's not being used um, for identity proofing at this point. Um, and I think we need to understand, you know, what level of trustworthiness um, and technologies deliver given levels of assurance with respect to dynamic authentication, and then see how we can use that on the front end for onboarding customers in a way that addresses risk, but is more inclusive, uh, again, speaking personally. Nice. And I'll just say on the inclusion side too, I, I think an issue that gets overlooked a lot is um, if you're poor, how hard it is to get an ID. If you've been recently evicted and you know your social security card and birth certificate were left in a you know soggy heap of a cardboard box on the side of the road, if you're fleeing a domestic you know abuse situation or you just got out of prison, um, you know in fact. And you participated with uh, uh, Pastor Ben Roberts from Foundry Methodist Church, who runs a group just down the road from here in D.C. called the ID Ministry that's basically focusing on, you know, with, you know, charitable donations and volunteers, um, helping people work through this process, because it's something that certainly in D.C. and most states as well, they don't have those services. And as we talk about going from physical to digital ID, perhaps based off of those foundational identity documents, it's important to make sure you first deal with some of the inclusion issues that we have there. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. I've got one more question I did want to ask because it's gotten a few votes. Uh, so for closing thoughts and you know maybe pivot into where we go next, the question was, there was a common thread here that says the U.S. government will never have a single identity solution. Uh, so what are some of the reasons driving this conclusion? Uh, and then I'd, I'd add to that as a closing you know, question, what do we end up with instead? So 30 seconds each person. Pat, I'll start with you. I mean, uh, how did the rollout of enhanced driver's license go? You know, we pushed that back how many years? How's the vaccine rollout going you know, across the country in different states? I'm a, I'm a fundamental believer in states' rights. Notarizations are governed by secretaries of state. Um, every state has the right to impose their own on policies on process. Um, so the way the way that the notarization market works, I think, is actually a good precursor, which is that every state has their own policy. There's reciprocity between states. And then what we're seeking now through a federal bill called the Secure Act is a minimum federal standard. So if you have a system, I, I think the other missing component is an audit requirement to be ensure that you meet the minimum standards. Um, you can have multiple different players, lots of innovation. They meet a minimum standard, have reciprocity and, and interoperability and standards between systems. And I think the other thing in my mind that's crucial is that um, the biometric or whatever it is, you know, the credential is stored locally on the consumer's device and they have possession of it. By the way, that's exactly how the iPhone works, the face ID. You know, it's not a cloud-based service. It's, it's local. There are patterns out here to follow. Um, I would add, going back to answer the last question, you gave me 30 seconds, I'm running out of time, international. We absolutely need reciprocity between between nations. Um, the systems and rules we put in place, there aren't credit systems in many other countries. How do you ask identity challenge questions? Um, so this is a much larger issue. And that's also, there's a model that's called NAPOSTI. This is out of the Hague. I can go on and on. So I think this is not a design challenge. This is an implementation and a buy-in challenge. Thanks. Pam, 30 seconds. Uh, so I would say permeable boundaries. We absolutely have to have permeable, ba permeable boundaries. You need to identify people within domains or with, you know, within areas. You need ways to relate those areas together, but you need rules that protect privacy between those areas, right? So otherwise we end up in a world and we may be in this world right now where the people who are best qualified to correlate us are the ad tech people 
right? And uh, you know, we need to we need to decide who should correlate and why, and then help everyone be successful in in defining those rules and enforcing them. Thanks, and Anne. Wrap us up. Thirty seconds. Okay. Well, um, I. I agree very much with what both Pam and Pat said. Um, and I think in that regard, we need not only um, national standards, uh, such as the NIST, um, but also mapping exercises between national standards um, that um, also can lead to global digital identity standards that support um, interoperable trust frameworks in different countries. And so the ISO type of work, um, I think, needs to really um, be accelerated and, and linked to the, the digital identity work stream in the ISO versus, you know, other very relevant work streams that you see the, the kind of bifur well, siloing there in, in global technical standards um, of the sort that we've been talking about, we need to overcome in a, in a regulatory and policy framework in each country. So I think um, global standards and um, certification bodies um, such as FIDO Alliance um, for, um, for various types of, of elements are really important. Um, and most of all, I think public-private partnerships um, in this country are critical for driving um, the development of the infrastructure that we, and, and then the solutions built on top of it that both the private sector and government at all levels urgently, urgently needs. Great, thanks. Well, now we're a couple minutes over time now, so I'm going to just say thanks to all of you, uh, Pam, Ann, Pat. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's been a great discussion. And uh, IGF USA, thanks for having us. And Dustin, let me hand things back to you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks everyone. For